to be the most pessimistic uh, uh, part of, of of the world. So I have some some uh, uh, credibility when I say that it's way too late for pessimism. Um, it's time for action. But the pathways to the hope cannot be found. They need to be built. And that's exactly why we are here. Systemic problems require systemic solutions. And it's pretty difficult to be systemic if you are by yourself. So we need to expose ourselves to new people, to new thinking, uh, new branch of sciences, new branch of uh, society. And uh, we need to expose ourselves also to conflict. Thank you, Yussi, and good morning also on my behalf. My name is Rina Koivuranta, and I work as a senior specialist in sustainability and responsibility at the University of Helsinki. And during these first uh, few days of the conference, I have really thought about this theme of hope and what it means to me and what it means, especially when we link it to sustainability transformations. And uh, in some of the sessions, we have heard about harmful hopes. We have heard about uh, researchers giving examples of what makes them hopeful. But uh, as with Yussi's example, we have also talked about hopelessness. Yesterday morning, when Susanna Lehvavirta gave her opening words, she said that she had a piece of advice from her husband and, oh, don't do that and don't be too pathetic. And, and I also had some advice before uh, thinking about these opening words. Uh, one of the advices was, do not use a cheesy quote that is outdated. And guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to use a cheesy quote, a quote that really is what I think that hope is when we talk about sustainability transformations. Uh, and this quote is by uh, John Parsi. Uh, he is the executive director of the Institute of Hope at the Arizona State University. And it goes like this. Optimistic people see the glass as half full, but hopeful people ask how they can fill up that glass. And I know it's, it's half glass half full and it's cheesy and I know but that really is the essence of hope and sustainability transformations for me as Yussi was saying I really see hope as the intentional act of goal setting and really striving purposefully towards those goals uh, in the past couple of years uh, the University of Helsinki and Aalto University have together uh, hosted co uh, co-organized uh, the Sustainability Science Days. And the vision has really been to try and create something that has an impact, that has a societal impact, that really has transformative power. That has been the vision behind the SSD. And I think it's fair to say that perhaps when it comes to that vision and the goal, the glass is not yet fully full to the brim. We have still work to do, but that is the goal that we have. And that is the intentional goal setting, uh, what we have in terms of sustainability science days. And uh, as our lovely Sophia said yesterday at the university reception, really what it comes down to is us here in this room, you in this room, uh, as Yussi was mentioning, really, uh, kind of exposing ourselves. Really, it comes to your engagement, your questions, really your voices and thoughts, and they make this conference. And really our braveness together to not shy away those tensions, as Yussi was mentioning, but really go forward in that pathway that we have. I wish you all a fruitful conference day.
Thank you so much, Yusi and Rina, for those inspiring opening words. So next, we are joined by two absolutely spectacular keynote speakers here to give us plenary addresses. The way the session methodology, if you will, is we will be uh, hearing approximately 20 minutes from our speakers. And then in between, after each speaker, we will have a little bit of time for questions and interaction together with the speaker. For our guests who are joining us online, please put any questions or comments that come to mind into the webinar Q&A, and we will keep an eye on those and make sure they get transmitted as time permits. And then for folks joining us here in the room, uh, we will use the old fashioned method of raise your hand and somebody will come around with a mic so you can ask your question. But I don't want to get ahead of myself because first we have to hear these super awesome speeches. Um, so without further ado, if I could please ask Tuli to join us on the stage. Good morning. Um, thank you for those really inspiring words um, and concerns. Um, I'm halfly awake. I tried to get my face uh, um, awake. And um, just to say that I'm super honored to be here and privileged to be here this morning. And I think yeah, already yesterday what we heard, um, the diversity of themes, uh, wonderful topics that resonate also with my talk today. My name is Tuli Mattelmeki, like I said, I come from Aalto University, from the Department of Design. Um, I'm not a sustainability scientist. I'm actually, my background is more or less in the human-centered and collaborative design. But my talk today is titled, A Creaturely Way of Being and Engaging. Do you see the picture? I wish I was there. It's a lovely island in Tvarmin, about 100 kilometers west from here. It's a very memorable moment to me uh, because I wasn't sleeping or sun tanning like a seal. I was actually trying to find a creaturely way of being. Through a simple awareness-based and embodied moment, tuning to a different scale, finding my roots, uh, and grounding uh, to the cliff, surrounded by the sea, um, the sky above me, being one in the system, and are really scaling up who I am and where I am. Other peer explorers in that workshop that was part of a, a, a larger project, uh, Baltic Sea Lab, went diving, felt uh, the, the sea around them, collected seaweed samples, among other things. For me, this was an insightful and impactful event. Um, but today, my presentation is about creative practices and how they can stimulate action towards socially and ecologically sustainable futures. In this presentation, I will first share a few uh, basics of a project called Creatures. And then I focus on our main findings and, and insights and results. Okay, the Creatures Project, uh, full name is Creative Practices for Transformational Futures. Um, uh, it was an EU funded Horizon 2020 project. Uh, we worked three years, we ended in the end of December last year. Yes, okay. Um, we, it was the project was coordinated by the University of uh, in Alto, but uh, we had eleven different partners involved all over Europe, and uh, the budget was about three million euros. I also want to introduce the consortium. Um, we co-created. We worked very very closely together, and uh, this project brought together diverse creative practitioners, researchers, and other experts 
to share the intention to support sustainable societal transformation. So in my presentation, I actually bring many of our uh, many voices to the presentation. That's also partially why I read uh, my notes, because it's important to, to recognize different team members. Uh, that's also why I wanted to show their faces uh, in Utrecht uh, last uh, spring, a year ago, after a long COVID period when we were not able to meet each other. Many of us actually had several hats in this project. Many of us were both researchers and creative practitioners. And in my view, that also brings a certain um, spice to this project. And it, it shows how the project was built and how, um, how we work together. And, and it also shows in the outcomes. Artists, researchers, uh, designers, and creative practitioners address sustainability questions in multiple ways. The project started, oh, thank you. I'm, I'm uh, slow in understanding that you need to change the slides. <laughs> um, so the project started with the stand that creative practices are needed more than ever. The pilot research by Anne Light and her colleagues um, already showed that creative practices are needed. Um, that already showed that collaboration, reflection, and direct collective engagements are the key to change the public's orientation to eco-social issues. In this context, transformative potential requires creative understanding that goes beyond rational thinking, including and involving emotional and personal components in the transformation work. This, in its turn, then supports creative thinking, imagination, brings, hopefully, the right kind of hope and inspire stories that stimulate action. So one of the, the things that we kept on saying over the project is that transformation towards eco-social sustainability means not only profoundly changing what we do, but also recognizing who we are as active players in our social ecological systems and how we do things both alone and together. This, in my view, resonates very nicely what we heard yesterday, both in the opening and the keynotes. So a design research, if we think about a little bit backwards, um, has, has a long tradition of applying different kind of creative, uh, experimental, experiential, participatory approaches to enhance and facilitate collaboration social change, imaginative world making. In this picture, you can see Marketa Doleshova's and her colleagues' creative and collaborative workshop outcomes from a two-day workshop called Experimental Food Design for Sustainable Futures. Marketa is here in the audience. Uh, in this workshop, they co-created human food relationships and speculated with alternatives to address the concern that food actually has a major role in our everyday and future sustainability. So applying these kind of approaches can prompt critical imaginative thinking, expand meanings and feelings, and hopefully also inspire certain kind of narratives and then um, people can act upon and change maybe their behaviors and even frames of thinking. So through these kind of open-ended interpretations, using ambiguity as a resource, and collaborative, collaborative design, we can also weave empathy and generate spaces for collective reflection. I don't know if you've heard about um, a paper called um, by Julia Benz and her colleagues from 2022 in the sustainability science called Beyond Blah, 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 exploring the how of transformation. Well, to me, that resonated, although I'm not so familiar with the conversation in that, in, uh, that particular journal. In that paper, they propose that there's plenty of what already, what we needs to be done, but there's lack of the how. And, and in the paper, they actually propose that we need to focus on how and move into action. They talk about means and manners. Means are the techniques and methods and the manners are um, ways in which things are done with the values included, the principles and relations. 
Now I take you back to my title um, of the talk that in my view resonates nicely with the means and manners and the call for how. In the Critches project, we worked a lot in thinking about certain kind of terms and values and the ways in which we want to um, convey our messages. We ended up using the term creaturely, meaning ways of being and doing involving a more gentle, connected approach where artificial lines between human and nature are not really needed. We offer creaturely as a placeholder for this kind of gentle and pluralist uh, life-focused ways of doing, being, and making. It's good to recognize that this term is an adverb. It's not a noun and it points to a way and it's not pointing to a state. And this also recognizes that sustain sustainable living is, um, it includes the whole life spectrum really. Um, how should we coexist? How should we care and receive care? Um, what do we eat with whom? How can we envision, envision where to go when the future seems to bring along only uncertainties? You can see in the picture here for, in the photo um, of an installation in Venice Biennale by Superflux, one of our partners in the project. And the work is called Refuge for Resurgence. It's an installation, a multi-species banquet, banquet, and it explores hope through crises towards a more than human world. This banquet is a celebration of different forms of life. One of the main aims of the project was to increase the visibility of existing transformational creative practices and strengthen their reach and effectiveness. We did that in many ways. And uh, during the project, we actually um, carried out 20 experimental productions. We call them productions. They are artistic or more design-oriented activities. They were documented and studied in a systematic way. They had different forms and topics. They were carried out and exhibited in different locations with different kinds of audiences and participants. I only here offer you a teaser with this picture of the website and the link. Please have a look. They are pretty amazing. Next one. Um, the other aim of the project was to promote action for social and ecological sustainability through creative practices. So to do so, we needed to understand what the creative practitioners are doing, what are they thinking, what are their strategies and tactics, um, and how should we talk about them, and how should we think about evaluating what they do. Here you see some examples from the research activities that we did uh, over the project, uh, mapping out tools, insights. There were moments in the project that we thought, oh my God, we actually opened some sort of a Pandora's box and um, the amount of tools, insights were just overwhelming. They were out of our control. They were moving as we tried to grasp them. Eventually, some of it, luckily also, <laughs> started to make sense and get shape. Next one, please. So the really, I'm really, really proud to introduce you to the Creatures Framework, and it's one of the main outcomes of the project. It's a website, and it was developed uh, and designed through a highly creative and iterative process engaging practitioners, uh, experts, researchers, policymakers, the Creatures team. Uh, the framework is available in creaturesframework.org, uh, and it collects these insights in an approachable and accessible way. Next one. The framework, well, based on various iterations, we learned that it's good to have four, these four different pathways, research, policymaking, creative practice, and funding. Each of them offers a collection of resources charting the key concepts, terms, processes, tools for evaluation, and uh, for resources for various stages of, of the creative practice. Next one. 
So one of the things that we really needed to look into was to understand what the creative practitioners are doing and what are the tactics that they use. And over this research, we ended up finding 25 creative pathways for change. These insights are based on working closely with more than 30 participants in the project, but also analyzing more than 140 other creative practices. We learned that many of these creative practitioners have long-term partnerships. They are well-networked. They have a long-term uh, activities going on. And um, they, operate, uh, they, they work closely across disciplinary borders. So not only artists or designers by themselves, but really having insights and, and close collaboration with the natural scientists, just to mention one. I'm uh, very honored to reference also the work of Anne Light and Lara Houston, who were uh, responsible of the work package that we called um, observ Observatory and, and uh, the work, uh, the 25 uh, Creative Pathways is really uh, something that they worked with. So in this uh, uh, research, the creative practitioners were asked uh, over the project many times, what does transformation mean to you? And what was found out that this term of transformation or transformational change or strategies for that matter did not really make a difference. It, it was not useful for them. Um, transformation is a massive word. Um, the creative practitioner sees change more like a relative, a re relative and re relational. Transformation, it takes time. And in their experience, it's more often gradual and incremental than urgent and radical. The creative practitioners seem to think how they can shift relations rather than how they can transform systems or achieve climate or biodiversity goals although those are, of course, in their, in their framing as well. They explore sustainability problems as cultural problems. So this is what you see when looking at these 25 different creative pathways of change and how they are mapped out. And maybe as an anecdote, we started in the project proposal, we talked about transformational strategies, um, and that's, that's what we started looking at, but we learned over the project that those that's not really the wording that uh, resonates with our creative practitioners and that's why creative pathways for change is is uh, the title next one please creative practitioners help to boost our ability to imagine both individually and collectively in the example here you see the treaty of finsbury park it is an immersive fiction and life action role play game by um, Furtherfield, one of our partners in the project. And uh, these participants together play roles, being plants or, or uh, animals. And they um, plan a major event for the future. So meaning that they need to negotiate and plan, take each other's points of view and needs into consideration. If we use these terms of uh, creative pathways, this is about role play, animals and plants, creating speculative spaces, bodies, using bodies as material. In the other picture, you see those beautiful lanterns, um, creative practitioners pay a great deal of attention to the aesthetics and uh, experiential quality of their work and the way it will be perceived. Nocturne by Isabel Beavers is a series of wild altars to be experienced outdoors as surprising encounters. The practice of offering a moment for rituals invites relocalization. We heard yesterday in one of the presentation that um, uh, that rituals actually is a way to enhance the connection with the nature. I think that's a very in inspiring, insightful comment. So in this one, you see that uh, using our terms of um, creative pathways, experiencing ritual, uh, rituals and myths and, and locality and mindfulness in the natural places. 
Next one. Very practitioners facilitate journeys uh, that are surprising, inclusive, and caring. The Yarmouth Springs eternal ex example here includes art, walking, nature projects, and brings participants into conversations about nature and nurturing the community roots and, and roots. And it's about activating communities, working from a particular place, and listening and making together. The other example is Helen's Sustainable Futures game, and it invites participants to co-imagine desirable future state in a playful way and co-create narratives that eventually can help in taking action individually and together. Next one. It's been clear in our project that creative practitioners, policymakers, funders, and researchers have had difficulties in expressing and even justifying what is the value of creative practices as a way to stimulate change. So the relationships between creative practices on one hand and the change processes or even their outcomes are complex and not, uh, you know, the straightforward kind of a of view. Um, in this slide, I'm quoting mostly Joost Verkot, who from Utrecht University, who was in charge of the evaluation work package. So as the outcome of our research, we propose an, some recommendations to take into account when evalu evaluating um, uh, creative practices and their impact. And these evaluations, are, are these recommendations are based on conversations with policymakers, uh, funders, well, and literature naturally. Um, so for example, our recommendations remind that evaluation is creative and that unexpected outcomes are valuable to, to keep in mind. I hope that adopting these uh, recommendations would actually mean that the value and the nature of creative practices for eco-social change is better recognized and appreciated. Next one. In this evaluation work, we've also reconsidered how to talk about creative practices and, and how to connect them with transformative change in terms of uh, evaluation. And in the framework, we proposed a nine dimension tool. The dimensions are grouped to these kind of three boxes, changing meaning, embodying, learning, imagining, uh, changing connections, caring, organizing, inspiring, unchanging power, co-creating, empowering, and subverting. We offer them both in uh, the boxes, but also in the form of, of uh, exciting creatures. Uh, these visuals were designed by um, Milja Komulainen, a very talented uh, visual communication designer. Next one. So if I bring you back to the uh, Treaty of Finsbury Bark, you can see that in these uh, dimensions, they, they were working with embodying, caring, and co-creating. Next one, please. So as you might imagine, um, the so what questions were asked many, many times, and we tried to answer them. Uh, these pictures are from the Baltic Sea Lab, uh, experimental production uh, guided by Julia Lohmann. Um, sometimes it's really impossible to even grasp the most, more subtle and individual moments and their impacts, like the story I told about my personal uh, moment on the cliff uh, surrounded by the sea and how that moment actually has changed many things in my head in, uh, later on. Um, if you look at the um, some insights by some uh, other participants in that workshop, um, we recognize, for example, a story by one of the um, participants with the natural science background, um, saying repeatedly how the way she observed and listened to the creative practitioners really some, so started to resonate in her in her mind. Um, and opened a whole new world to look at her own research traditions. 
Um, it is true that creative processes can shake us out of our everyday frames. And that's why also many creative practitioners um, take and ask their audiences and participants to have moments on individual and collective processes of reflection uh, that can also lead to deeper learning. Next one. Maybe some of you think uh, uh, along what I'm thinking that creative practices can also be very scary. They can be foreign and, and absolutely weird. Um, but then both the ability and willingness are important for shifting perspectives and adopting new roles and practices. It sometimes might require letting go of control. Let the situations and encounters lead and trust that something will emerge. Therefore, also in our view, the change towards ecosocial sustainability is a capacity building task. Next. So it is really the time that creative practices are recognized as active agents stimulating ecosocial change. And in my presentation, I've highlighted uh, insights and tools from the Creatures Project that helped in better understanding the nature and contribution of creative practitioners. We also proposed a creaturely as a placeholder for a more gentle, connected, and pluralistic and life-focused way of doing, being, and making. Please join us. Thank you. Thank you so much for that really interesting insight into the work that you've been doing with creatures. Um, now we have time for questions, comments. Um, so if anybody would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. I'm shocked that I decided this. Yes, down in front. So on, yeah, good, good. Hey, <clears throat> thank you, Tuli, for a very inspiring presentation. Yesterday we discussed with, with Rina on the challenge of crossing the barriers of different sciences in this kind of environment. When you have a lots of uh, specific, you have a track record and lots of uh, specific knowledge on a certain topic, uh, but you have none on the other or very little on the other. And, and you have a tendency to not to kind of like start to operate on other person's field. And that might, that kind of like mental barrier might hinder the collaboration. What do you think, what, what's the, what, what could be the kind of like uh, platforms or practices that could lower that barrier? Well, I think we are experiencing something today. Uh, this, this conference are already I think people who come here, they definitely need to already have this kind of mindset that they want to learn new things. Um, if I refer to the Creatures Project, uh, we were kind of like-minded, but absolutely not from the same disciplines. And of course, it, it can uh, cause clashes. And, and uh, um, I in my view, also these creative practices, co-design, co-creation, these kind of tools help are, or at least can support uh, finding those those uh, you know bridging those those barriers that we've experienced. Um, I know also, for example, uh, Julia Lohmann, uh, one of our professors here, she has used her practice and inviting people to her practice so that the 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 practice also starts to uh, resonate and create these kind of conversations that help then move forward together. But yes, it's it's one of these big challenges. And sometimes I think we just don't even listen uh, when we notice that we don't uh, understand or, or recognize the conversation or the theories that are used. Thank you. Uh, in the middle right there in black. Uh, 
Thank you. Amos Taylor, Finland Futures Research Center. Oh, Finland Futures Research Center, Amos Taylor. Um, I have a question about, um, uh, so in this uh, relationship, um, could you talk a little bit about the role of artists? So it, a lot often in these kind of collaborative projects, uh, you have the creative part or the artist has the certain kind of burden, you know, they're put into a different difficult situation and they have to use all their creativity. Often they're the least paid in, in these kind of projects. Um, but it seems you've managed to do some something different in the co-creating, but could you kind of identify how how yes. that kind of creative role, the role of creatives within there and how they can be kind of also empowered and not exploited or extracted? Thank you. Very good question. I just something came to my mind to to follow up on on Yussi's answer. Humor and jokes was one of the things that you know one of our uh, partners, Felipe Jill, um, repeatedly mentioned that connects people. So that's that's also one way to go. But I'm not very good in jokes though. Um, going back to your um, your question, we were lucky in the project that it was constructed in a way that we had these artists and creative practitioners who actually were funded from the from the, the EU funding. And then we also had a budget where we were able to commission uh, other other um, uh, artists and creative practitioners. And um, uh, they were interviewed, they they were really strongly part of the project. And um, what we've learned and the feedback we've gathered is that uh, much of these um, activities uh, like interviews and reflection sessions that we, they were invited to part of or the workshops um, also they gained a lot. And, and, and um, if I may say, Julia, for example, said that that in, in this project, it seems like she gained a vocabulary to her work that maybe was not there as strongly in before. So um, I have a feeling that we had a very co-creative relationships, but I can understand that there might be also this, these kind of feelings that some people like, are like in a, in a zoo, you know, behind the, you know, just ma making a pro performance and others are looking, we try to, create a more equal relationship. Yes, hello. I am Julia Lohmann. <laughs> Julia has been mentioning. So it's a really good question because sometimes this is, sometimes artists come in too late, almost for the dissemination part only, and then you're losing the biggest benefit, um, which I think is part of this bridge building task, because the minute you have materials and creative practices and give the ability to like <clears throat> all of the participants to co-imagine something with these tools, you have artists in the process, um, not just as another outcome somehow. And it's very powerful in this creative process. And especially when you're working with different disciplines, because it forces people to speak in a language that goes beyond the disciplinary boundaries and can connect. Other questions? We down here with the red sweater on your shoulders. Thank you for your very inspiring presentation with a lot of cases. I'm from Estonian Business School from Estonia, and I'm dealing with curricular development. And while listening to your presentation, I was thinking other possibilities or maybe tools that you uh, actually practiced which you can use for curricula in different different disciplines because these very important things like awareness rising about sustainability they can be applied like in business studies like in education in chemistry whatever mm. uh, maybe you had already examples of these tools that you used for curricula to raise awareness of uh, students about sustainability yeah. yeah. So the question was about um, whether these kind of tools can be used in curriculum uh, development and, and ed education in, in more widely. They are in use. They, they for example, in uh, Alto, we have a creative sustainability program that is cross-disciplinary program. And, and some of these are, are already there in use. I know uh, Jost Verpot in, in Utrecht, for example, 
utilizes some of these methods with his students that are not really from design uh, necessarily. Um, and I hope they will spread. We also uh, have uh, written a paper. Um, it's uh, author. Uh, the first author is Jaakkola uh, about transformational learning and how these these uh, embodied and and creative uh, practices are also can be uh, helping in in the transformational learning. So yes, uh, and we are also initiating a new project that is about you know, design pedagogies and maybe uh, somehow we could tap on that and, and whether those kind of pedagogies could be used also elsewhere. I also want to invite our online participants. If you want to write a question in the Q&A, we will be keeping an eye on that too. And how about in the room? Oh no, it really is morning, isn't it? Yeah. We're all putting our faces on still. Any other questions, comments? Yes, right there. Artur Poprawski from Humak University in, in Helsinki. Um, I, I would like just to appreciate the way you formulated uh, points on evaluation. I mean, this is very often missed or not so much highlighted, uh, why you highlighted the, the role of evaluation and different dimensions. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, fantastic. Well, we are doing really well this morning. Thank you so much, Tuli. Really appreciate it. Round of applause. All right, so I have the pleasure to introduce our next uh, plenary speaker who is with us this morning for another fantastic presentation. Um, I won't take up too much airtime, so Ian, please feel free. None of the work. Doesn't work. Can I have yeah, the other roaming mic? mic? Hey, mic, give me the mic. mic. Give me the mic. <laughs> and I will make this here. Yes, yes, happening. Good morning, everybody. It's a real privilege to be here, um, and I'm particularly humbled because I get to speak in my own native language, and almost most of you are not. So um, thank you for that, and and thank you for the effort that you put in to be saying it in your own in in, a, through, in English through a different language. Um, I just wanted to ask a question and wake you up a little bit, um, but I'm wondering how hopeful you feel. And I'm going to ask you the question, how, how hopeful you feel. You've got one of three answers. You're going to be hopeful. You're pretty hopeful about the future. Maybe somewhere in the middle. Maybe you're pretty unhopeful. So let's have a show of hands. How many of you are hopeful? I'm going to put myself in that camp. Okay, look, look around. Put your hands right up. Put your hand, that's it. Look around to see what the, what the room's doing. How many is in the middle somewhere? Oh, there's quite a lot of them. Um, and how many are unhopeful? Oh, there's a few, okay, but not as many as I perhaps expected. Okay, so that, that's, that's really good. Now, uh, after, after that question, just, just think about or consider how you feel about that. Just consider how you feel about it. Okay, and I'll come back to that later. Now, we know we're at the end of the world as we know it. We might not feel it, but we know we're at the end of the world as we know it. Whether we like it or not, transformations are happening. They're here. Whether that's the impacts of things like climate change, we're not going to have glaciers, or whether it's through our efforts to steward the change that we need in society, then, um, then it's, a, it's a real challenge. So next slide, please. So we're at the end of the world as we know it, and we have to accept that. That then raises the questions, well, how do we support more desirable transformations? If transformations are inevitable, then we need to find a way of steering and navigating this change in a way at least helps us come out the other end in some positive form. And I'm going to talk about three things in this presentation that I think are important. They're not the only things, but I think they're particularly important. First, we have to accept we're in a transformation in the first place. Then we need to embrace radical perspectives of what we want to change to, or what we need to change to. And then finally, what I'm mostly going to talk about is the importance of coming back to our senses and how we feel in order to, as a, as a sort of starting point in a way through that. 
So as I say, we've got to accept we're already in a transformation. If we don't accept we're already in it, it's very difficult for us to let go of what we need to let go of. And we all struggle with that. If you think about transformation already been highlighted by Thule, it's a, an interesting concept, but generally it involves some kind of fundamental change, a systemic change, a cultural change, a change in values and mindsets, as well as our operations and our practices and, and what we do in the world. It's qualitatively distinct to other forms of change. So it's different to adjustments or reforms, which are about usually about change to keep things the same, rather than change to get something fundamentally different. The often used example, it's a very good one, is that is the shift from a caterpillar to a butterfly. It goes into a chrysalis, it actively dissolves itself, and then it reallocates the same resources to create something new, a butterfly. But it, it's not about creating fatter, fitter, more efficient caterpillars. It's about creating a butterfly, and that butterfly has a very different function, ability, and purpose. It can fly, it can co-create, it's completely different. And that's really, really key. So when we're talking about transformation, however we get there, whatever pathways, we have to recognize that it's a significant change. And that allows us then, to a degree, to be able to accept um, uh, uh, what, what we're in and what we're dealing with. And it looks a little bit like that image. Sometimes we're looking into the abyss, standing down, looking at this big hole be below us and this big challenge that we face um, and, um, uh, and go from there. I'm struggling to remember to change the slide. So let's go back to that, that picture. Can we change slides, please? Change slide, yeah. So that's the image that I've just been talking about. So we struggle to look into that abyss and, and take that leap. And it leaves us with that question. Are we ready to embrace the transformation? Really embrace it, recognize we're in it, and take that step forward into the unknown in terms of what that means. Next slide, please. And then that leads us to the question, well, what you know to to what are we trying to transform towards and some of those have already been talked about yesterday shift towards a post-growth economic uh, condition for example next slide please one of the concepts i particularly like about that uh, around this is the idea of regenerative systems or regenerative futures um, you can see in this diagram here ref that there's a big difference between many of our sustainability approaches over the last 30 or 40 years which have tended to focus on reducing harm to sustainable levels changing our practices really to keep things the same, not really to change things, but to reduce harm. Whereas what instead we need is we need to develop and create and find ways of re-engaging with the natural systems that are naturally regenerative. If you think of a forest, all the individual aspects within a forest, the species, they have a unique place in that ecosystem. But regeneratively, they together create the conditions conducive to life. Humans are not that. We are extremely degenerative. Many of our actions and activities are unconducive to creating life. And so we need some different ways of thinking about, about those kinds of futures, fundamentally different ways of dealing with that. Next slide, please. I'm not going to talk about that too much more, but I just want to say that that idea of regenerative systems, and there are many other ideas out there as well, um, but it's taking hold now in many different areas from whether it be economics, development, agriculture, or indeed cultures. So it's, it's worth looking into um, if you're not familiar with that one. Next slide, please. And this brings me to mainly what I wanted to say today, which is um, an entry point. There are many entry points into this, but it can be very difficult to think about how we get to regenerative futures or deal with the kinds of transformations that we're, we're we need to, to face. But one of those is to come back to our senses, coming back to how we feel. And I think we've often lost that. Next slide, please. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by our senses? Well, in a sense, we are sensing beings. We feel things all the time, every moment of the day. I can feel the floor as I walk on it. You might feel your clothes or the seat you're sitting on. Maybe you have a sense of the person next to you or a sense of the room. We're sensing this all the time. And yet we think we're thinking. We don't sense that we're sensing. And that's really key. And as Peter Levine talks about, uh, he's a psychologist who works with many patients with trauma. It's our embodied senses and past experience that create us. They then create how we respond to others, how we respond to different circumstances, how we respond to a question about how hopeful we are. It affects us. 
and that affects how we engage with the future and our ability to change. Next slide, please. So one of the key reasons why we might need to come back to our senses then and how we sense um, is because it actively affects whether we can be open or collaborative. This is a model by Stephen Porges. It's a model of um, essentially three different states that mammals, particularly human beings, can be in. And it's, we're literally hardwired in the way in which we have our nervous systems. So the bottom one there is that sort of condition of social engagement, what we call the ventral vagal state. It's when we're calm and we're open. We can feel compassion and collaborative. Another very useful state for us is the fight or flight or sympathetic state. So if you're being chased by a bear, you want to be super, super focused. You want to get away from it. It's not the time to probably be very compassionate, right? You want to get out of the way. You're going to be super, super focused. Um, and, and, and then in, and that, that comes when we're, we're faced with a threat. And then when we're really faced with an existential crisis, survival crisis, we can go into what we call a dorsal vagal state, which is just kind of like curling up and hiding away. Maybe you felt that if you felt overwhelmed, you just want to go to bed and curl up. And that, that's one of the senses. Now, people move in and out of those states. But as Stephen Poor just points out, we are in a deeply evaluative world now. Social media, stress from exams, stress from producing the next published paper or whatever it might be, right? And so many people are now getting stuck in the fight or flight, which makes it very, very difficult for them to be able to collaborate, be open, be compassionate to others who might also be undergoing their own challenges. And so coming back to our senses, as Peter Levine and Stephen Paul just talked about, when they work with their, their clients in these conditions, it is very much about coming back to how they feel because it's the body that is driving and the mind and the body in that interaction that is driving many of these things. We can't get through the transformation without engaging with our senses. A very simple example, our sight. One of the things, if you're rushing to work and you've got that focus, but like being chased by the bear type thing, how often do you actually open up your eyesight so that you're aware of the periphery? And you can use techni techniques like that to practice them, to come out and help you shift more readily through these different states. Again, opening up our capacity to be collaborative. Next slide, please. And that's the image there that I wanted to show. Okay, next slide. Another really key aspect of coming back to our senses is it's absolutely critical for wise action. Aristotle talked about three kinds of knowledge. You can see in here, epistemic knowledge, that's the abstract form of knowledge, PowerPoint presents, presentations like this one, a paper, um, an essay, something like that. That's the, the abstract form of knowledge. But he also said we also need te technical knowledge or techni, as he called it, and that's an embodied form of knowledge. So if you're driving a car, you're not using episteme, you're using your body to sense and feel the subtle changes that are happening as you drive that car. We don't create that. We don't learn that through reading a book. The third form of knowledge he talks about is phrenesis, and that's a sort of ethical and moral form of knowledge. What makes a good or right end? I could be driving the car with a bomb in the back, or I could be driving the car somebody to a hospital. Completely different. So it's those three things that make wise person or wise action. And as Nicholas Maxwell points out, we don't, and as already Tuli, you pointed out this out as well, we don't need more understanding of the nature of social and biophysical phenomena. We need to develop very quickly the wisdom about how to act. And so coming back to our senses is necessary as part of that, because if we're just focusing up here, then that's not enough. We also have to engage very much in here as well. I love this quote. Next slide, please. By D.H. Lawrence, my belief is in the blood and flesh as being wiser than the intellect. The body unconscious is where life bubbles up in us. It's how we know that we are alive, alive to the depths of our souls and in touch somewhere with the vivid reaches of the cosmos. Our body is wiser than our minds. Interesting. Let's go to the next slide, please. The third point I threw in because of Andy Sterling's talk yesterday, um, and he talked about our need for a shift from the paradigm of control to the paradigm of caring. Well, if we want to care, we have to allow ourselves to feel. We've got to come back to our senses. I'm going to say anything more than that. Next slide, please. And then I think this is particularly important, and I think you were touching on this, Thule, as well, and that is that um, we've got to somehow be able to imagine those new futures, those new kinds of futures, and embody them. 
and become part of them. And I suspect that's very much what was happening with some of your creatives in, in their work. And on one hand, it's very hard to imagine something perhaps we don't have experience of. How can we create something if we can't imagine it? When, you, when the caterpillar shifts to a butterfly, it's really interesting because it has these imaginal cells, so it dissolves itself, and it has these sort of thing called, things called imaginal cells, so it knows, has a sense of what it needs to do to be turned into a butterfly. And yet, we do have experience of this because it's all around us. As soon as you step past a tree, that is part of the experience that we can have. So often being able to experience and imagine regenerative futures is about learning to sense in these natural environments. There's an interesting, some people call it condition, I call it ability, called synesthesia, where some people experience a sense as another sense. So they might see something in color and then they taste it, or they might hear something and then they see it as color. That's a really interesting thing because many creatives have that ability. And you can actually learn that ability. If you practice enough engaging sufficiently with your different senses, you can start to sense things in different forms and you can start to develop that, that union of the senses, understanding the whole, understanding your part better within that whole, especially if you do this in nature. Now, shamanic cultures, which are across most continents of the world, for hundreds of thousands of years have known this. The term shaman comes from uh, a Siberian tribe, and it means bringing light into the dark or seeing in the dark. It's about sensing the other and sensing one's connection to what is around one. And that, that is, uh, and, and the shamanic cultures build that into their culture. There were a couple of talks related to that that I went to yesterday. A really interesting thing you can do if you're interested in this is next time you go into a forest or a, a Finnish Maya or bog, Ask yourself, not what can I observe, but how is nature observing me? How is nature sensing me in my presence? And that starts to shift your sense of what your place is in the place you're in. You're starting to experience what natural regeneration might be. Next slide, please. Of course, we've known this, as I've alluded to already, we've known this for a very, very long time. As Robert Moore points out in his book on initiation, sacred space, ritual process, again, coming out from the last talk too, lead mentioned ritual, the consistent factor in pre-modern times was not the belief in God, but belief in some kind of regenerative power that could be tapped into for personal and social regeneration. Robert Moore talks about how we've lost connection to that sacred, the sacred being that, uh, that regenerative kind of condition. That's what he's talking about. And we've lost connection to who or what we are as a result of that as well. We need to come back to our senses to be able to um, uh, understand some of that at a deeper level. Next slide, please. And of course, this is a real challenge for universities. You know, if you think about the development of most of our modern universities over the last 300 years, they've developed as, through science and, and research that makes the assumption that good research comes from separating our minds from our senses standing from the outside looking in observing something not recognizing we're part of it not recognizing that the feelings that we have shape the questions we have and, and what happens of course it's brought many benefits through modernity but it also has many limits and as highlighted by Steve, uh, by andy sterling yesterday it's also very controlling there's some even worse critiques about where we're at with that stuff by nicholas maxwell won't go into that now but universities, if we remember, are dominated by epistem epistemic knowledge. I'm standing up here giving a PowerPoint presentation. There's a limited focus on the development of know-how. Business models are actually based on episteme. We can run a conference or we can have um, many uh, uh, students in a class if we're just delivering information. Getting them to develop the hands-on space that they need to be able to develop know-how or even develop phrenesis is a completely different matter. So our whole business models, the way our universities tend to operate are based on, on the notion of epistemic knowledge and delivering epistemic knowledge, not developing the wisdom that we need to create. And of course, the sacred is really not allowed to enter our universities. It's out of our minds, it's not part of that. And this condition is deeply prevalent. I spent quite a lot of time the last 10 years trying to find ways of 
shifting things in universities. And I've come to the conclusion that it's so deeply ingrained, it's, it's very, very difficult to shift it. I'm not sure what the answer is. Maybe the answer is to accept we're in a transformation that many of our institutions are not going to get through this transformation that we're in, in the current form. And maybe that's the way forward. But I do think we're failing to tap into the human potential and creativity, as I think you've really highlighted, Tuli, in your previous talk. So where does that leave us? We like practical solutions from these things. I think for me, if we're thinking about coming back to our senses, it literally comes about how we're relating, our pathways of relations. Now, when, how often do you actually really ask somebody, how are you feeling? And really listen to the answer. Maybe we should be starting every meeting, having a conversation about where we're at, bring, allowing us to bring the whole person into the room as we have these conversations. So there are some very basic things that we can do that would help us along that way if we're able to remember to do that. It's not easy, but it's a starting point. So the point really, I guess, the journey that I wanted to say, um, thanks for spotting that slide change. Well done, you're keeping up. Um, uh, in, in our journey is um, that I really believe we're in over our heads. Our heads are not enough to be able to address the kinds of challenges or work with the challenges we're facing. And what I've been saying is we need to accept that transformation is happening. We need to find ways of imagining and embodying regenerative dynamics and futures. And part of the route towards that is really recognizing that we need to come back to our senses. Is there hope? Let's go back to the question that I posed at the beginning. I have accepted that the change is happening, that many things will not, we won't be able to sustain many of the things that we have now. I've, I've come to accept that, the glaciers, some of our institutions and so on. That's given me a little bit freedom not to try and hold on to it. But I am actually quite hopeful. And I'm hopeful because I believe that we actually know what we need to do. We have a lot of the tools, whether they come from indigenous cultures or they come from our own practices and our own understandings. As long as we let ourselves into that and we have the tools particularly to come back to our senses because at the end of the day we are sensing beings not thinking beings and as alan watts uh, pointed out you didn't we didn't come into this world we came out of it like a wave from the ocean we're not a stranger here we're not a stranger to our bodies we're not a stranger to the world that's around us we can start feeling our way through some of this to a much much greater degree now the irony next slide please the irony um has not escaped me that I'm giving this epistemic talk and I wanted to try and make it at least partially experiential. And I have a great friend, Heather, who, and she lives out way out on the, well, the west coast of Scotland in the outer Hebrides on, on, on the Isle of Lewis. And she's a, 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 an artist, poet, healer, um, locally known as the Joy Witch. Very interesting. She does work called what we call death dueling work. So it's helping people at the end of their lives to bring joy back into that and helping them transition in this great transformation that they're about to undergo. And she told me a great story of how she was working with a woman with dementia. And the interesting thing about dementia is it's it, it, the, the, the sense of smell and taste is one of the last things to go. And memories are very deeply connected to a sense of smell and taste. So they can remember things from their long past, but not their short term things. And the interesting thing was that she, she said that um, uh, because she couldn't really remember very much towards the end of her life, she used to come in each week with a birthday cake and pretend it was a birthday to bring joy back into her life. And the care home staff found it quite, uh, they were quite confused one day when they found the two of them climbing out of a window. They're saying, what are you doing? She said, well, she wanted to climb out of the window. I just want to bring some joy back into her life as we do that. Okay, let's climb out the window then. So, so that's some of the bits of work that she does. And she wrote a poem and actually inspired me to give this talk. And we created a shorter version specifically for this conference that we're going to play. Um, and I would invite you as we go into this, we're gonna drop, drop the lights down and invite you for the next couple of minutes, just to drop back into your senses and listen to the resonant voice of Heather um, and uh, enjoy that as a sensual experience. When the ache of aliveness creeps out of the closet 
and desperation to become overpowers the presence to be. Listen, dear one, come to your senses. When anxiety grips your lungs and your breathing is shallow, remember your ribs, be in your bones. Let your feet feel ground and gravity. Give in to the process, get out of your mind. When you can't take another thought, take another breath. If the human world is overwhelming, throw open the door and step into the wild. Build a den, your own earth lodge. Light a fire inside yourself. Curry in for time outside of time. If you've forgotten who you are, follow wild footprints, pick up fallen feathers. Go on a treasure hunt, snout to the ground. Be lost and find what you're not looking for. If you find yourself heavy with burdens, carry your concerns to the soil. Graciously give them away. Touch fur, touch fern. Unfurl your grief. Let nature adorn you, anoint you, wrap its resonance around you. Come to your senses. Listen for wind in the trees. Let leaves rattle until you become hollow, until you are an instrument, until you are the song. And if comparison still bangs from some inner prison, in anger, in shame, or in doubt, be kind. Throw yourself a key, unlock your ancestors, paint your own portrait, be sure to set yourself free. What else is there to do, O oh sister, O oh brother? Let the green breath of birch have her way with you. I see you among the trees, sunlight and shadows, more than meets the eye. Remember, we are all children of the same mother. Come to your senses. Come as you are. The last slide up as well. Yep. Find that on her website so you can download that if you like. When I first heard that, I cried. Maybe some of you feel that way too. Thank you. I'm not crying, you're crying. Got me in the feels a little. Um, wow, thank you very much. Um, I don't know about all of you, the Joy Witch, it's just kind of heart. Um, but all that aside, we um, now have some time for questions and comments after that super amazing uh, plenary talk. And so can we go right here in the middle, please? Thank you. Can we clear? Yes, yes, yes. Um, Hamza from University of Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. So um, as days goes on, the hope uh, diminishing and coming up, diminishing, coming up. When um, I was growing in early 90s, uh, my, my, my parents used to harvest more than 30, uh, 30 uh, sacks of maize. But last year, unfortunately, even one sack, it was difficult. So when we are saying coming to our senses means we, is it possible for we to come into our senses while we are divided? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the challenging question there. I don't know the answer. I'm really sorry. I, I think the... Um, Ultimately, it comes back to our senses. So the, the, if we're not feeling um, what your parents are feeling and we're not sharing those feelings, 
how could we change the way that we might operate, I might operate as a person in order to enable them to have their maze. So, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure I know the answer there, but, um, but ultimately it comes actually back to how we feel at the end of the day. If we're not feeling and we're not allowing ourselves to feel, we don't really have any hope, I don't think. I have right here in the green. Hi, I'm Marcin. If I can just continue that, because uh, what comes to my mind that I'm not a, um, English is not my mother tongue, so I'm not sure about that. But it's not like the kind of paradox that you have also the word not only senses or sensual, but also consensual. Uh, and of course, it means something else. Like there's, for instance, a project in the in the US, in New York, like a consensual leadership orchestra. So there are, there's no conductor. So people are sharing the the, uh, the, their, um, uh, the duty of being a conductor. So it's like circular leadership model of or chamber orchestra. So in that sense, maybe consensual could mean something that we try to read ourselves, understand ourselves and read our sensual perception of what we do together, like right? and, and how we share that. So but there, if I'm right, if the word consensual can be helpful to answer the question on um, uh, feeling or using the senses together. Right? I, I, I love that because I haven't thought of that word consensual. I actually had a slide that I took out because I decided I didn't have time, but I had thrown a, lo a load of different words in. And in our language, at least in the English language, it's really mixed up. So you've got things like consensual or sensibilities, making sense of something. Um, and then you've got things like out of our minds. But, you know, the, 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 there's some negative connotations to some of the words we have as well as the, the sort of positive. Um, so our language is... I feel is mixed up in terms of what we're talking about. You know, they've lost their mind, but then we're out of our minds, oh, but we need our senses. So there's this whole combination of things in there that are language I don't think really conveys it, um, which is not surprising because we know that language is, is not a great way of conveying a lot of what we do. And so when, particularly then when we engage in epistemic knowledge, um, then, then it's a challenge. I was wondering with Thule's talk, um, when you were explaining the language, I was thinking, but does that really express really what was going on? And I guess it probably wasn't for the creatives that were in there as well. But I, I love, love that idea. I'll remember that one. Thank you. And then we have a question that's come in online from a university, uh, um, excuse me, Lapland University of Applied Sciences a participant there. And this builds on some of the things that have already been asked live in the room, but they're asking really directly, how can we accept ourselves without having care of society? Say that again. How can we accept ourselves if we don't have that care for society? How do we accept ourselves if we don't have care of that society? I personally feel um, that the uh, caring for ourselves is the beginning part of that. So we have to learn to care for ourselves as much as we need to learn to care for others. And often we're not very good at it. So if you think about some of the, in the Western societies, the, the notion of perfectionism is prevalent. It's a sort of archetypal psyche that we have that everything has to be perfect. And it drives us to do certain things in certain ways without us really understanding it. And one of the conditions that we have in our societies to accept ourselves, if you think about young people dealing with their social media challenges, that's very much about the challenge of accepting ourselves. So I would answer to that then, I think that, that accepting ourselves is possibly a precursor to being able to care for others. It's the beginning part of it. Compassion to yourself. Passion to yourself, very, very important. Uh, down here in the uh, suit jacket. Thank you for the conference. I'm Professor Salemi from Algeria. I'm happy to be with you. Uh, thank you for the presentation, the colors, the words. But I was uh, a bit surprised. You don't mention resilience, resilience of nature, resilience of human. Why? You don't measure resilience at all. So I, so I used to work on resilience and I did that for about 10 years. But what I found is the way that resilience, and it's not necessarily the way it's sort, thought of in academia, the, 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 the way resilience is often interpreted outside of academia is it's about keeping things the same. So it's about change to keep things the same. So for example, I did a lot of work with emergency services sector. There's a whole division called resilience in the Scottish government, but that's about dealing with emergencies. And it was mostly about efficiencies. How do we make things more efficient to respond quicker to the challenges that we've got? I know there are other ways of thinking about resilience, 
Uh, but I came to the conclusion that that then actually the question was about transformation, because we we are unlikely to be able to keep things the same and retain that resilience. Resilience, on the other hand, though, is really particularly important for people. If we're not resilient in our own ways of dealing with the challenges, compassion to ourselves and so on, uh, then it's going to be very difficult for us to navigate and hold our place in the world, hold our, un our sense of ourselves and allow ourselves to be confident in being able to show our feelings. So, yes, it relates in there. Many things can come into that. But I've tended to steer away from the term resilience at the moment because I feel that in a lot of cases it's being misused or misunderstood. Oh, our hand in the, oh no, it's still there in the back right there. Yeah, hi, um, thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, I'm, I'm afraid maybe I'm throwing a spanners in the works here a bit. Um, I, I think you arrive at many conclusions I, I agree with, but I think in many ways you arrive, in many ways you arrive on, to them on, on the maybe premises I can't really entirely agree on. For example, um, he used a beautiful example of transformation of caterpillar to the butterfly, but I think this uh, comparison limps on all caterpillar legs because the you can of course look at the reason why it does this transformation is to create more very efficient caterpillars. So um, the resilience of the system really is in in my understanding really we need to keep some things the same. And these are these resilient bits. And so transformation is not really needed in what you call nature, but in our understanding of the world. And, and I think that you use a lot of dichotomies like mind, body, etc., like thinking and feeling, which even neurophysiologically are not really supported because the brain is not just thinking and uh, neurophysiologically uh, sensing is brain. Sorry about the spanner. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's a spanner at all. I think that's the nuances of what we're talking about here. There are many questions in what you've, what you've asked, of all of which I could probably answer a little bit of it. What I'm giving is a shorthand of some of that and trying to put it into a wider, wider sort of picture. Um, if I just take the butterflies ex example, that's just an analogy, it's a metaphor. Um, the butterflies we had in the past, right? was modernity. We now need new butterflies. So, so we need a different form in that. So that's, a, that's moving away from the metaphor and the power of the metaphor in that, but it is, is about, about how we move forward. You know, the futures that were considered to be the, the directions we wanted in the past are, are now the problem, and that will always be the case. Nothing stays the same forever. Um, so that's just one example of one of the answers in there, but you know, it's, it's about how you picture that and you, and you have to work with those nuances. The mind-body relationship is not, as you say, it's not really a relationship. It's all one, right? And, and our failure, there's, there's a lot of work on how in neuroscience um, uh, that we're not even, we don't even have a thinking, sensing brain as such. Um, we, we're actually just a highly predictive being that, we, that everything that we're experiencing is actually a prediction. And I didn't go into that because I didn't have time, but it's a, there are some of massive developments happening in neuro neuroscience at the moment that are, are changing how we understand brain, mind, and body. Yeah. So can't answer them all at the moment in, in, in one, one short talk. I have time for one more. How about Julia? Yeah, thank you for a, for a super inspiring speech. Um, I wanted to ask you, it relates a little bit to what the last person has been saying. So quite often, this transformation is kind of hijacked or sold to us as this very technocratic kind of um, transformation that um, in a way takes us more out of our senses, more out of the forest. So quite often when you then say, well, let's be more embedded in our bodies, in the environments, um, like the regenerative um, kind of mindset has it, understanding ourselves as part of these ecosystems, then quite often, that scene is going backwards, backwards in time, not jumping, not going into this future. How do you deal with this kind of two mindsets that are somehow in conflict there? And yeah, how do you deal with these kind of questions? Yeah, so, so I, I, to, to me, the tr ultimately the transformation that we are in as a society is a transformation of consciousness. 
um, into transformation and a shift through um, uh, through, as Andy Sterling was talking about yesterday, that, that sort of period of modernity. Um, it has come to an end. It can no longer sustain itself. Um, so in, in answer to your question, I don't think it is going back. We, we're not going to go back to the period before um, agriculture was created and we, we had a, a serious move away from um, being embedded in the ecosystems that we're in and reliant on that. So something different will have to, to emerge. And yet many of those practices and many of those ideas and they come from many different cultures and in different forms, are still highly relevant today, in part because we've become so focused on our thinking or minds or um, our perceptions and our concepts of what minds might be, and we operate in that way rather than engaging with our senses. So I don't know if that helps, but um, that's, that's where, I, where I sit at the moment. But it's continuously evolving, I think. So if you've got better ideas, let me know. <laughs>